Hey there, YouTube. Baylor here. And today, I want to talk about silence, specifically how silence can defeat the corrupt heart at the end of Act 4 in Slay the Spire almost every time. To tell you how, I'm going to be playing a run as this character on Ascension 5. This is approximately the intended balance point of the game, as stated by the devs. There are, of course, 14 higher ascension levels, or 15 higher ascension levels, all the way up to 20. And if you'd like advice for defeating the corrupt heart as silent on Ascension 20, I highly recommend the live stream, which you can find linked below this vid. But today we'll be playing on Ascension 5 and showing off how the toolkit of this character can consistently tackle the corrupt heart in Slay the Spire. As we go, I'll try my best to explain all of our different options at each turn and how we consistently build towards uh, getting an eventual victory. First thing you should do in your run of Slay the Spire, no matter the character, but uh, particularly if you're looking to defeat the heart, you should look at the very top of the map and investigate the boss icon that you see there. You'll see one of three icons and that indicates which of the three Act 1 bosses you're up against. Each boss has a different requirement, a different move set that they use against the player that'll require different cards to get past. This one is the Guardian, and I'd say this is probably one of the easiest bosses for this character, the Silent. The Guardian will require that we can consistently block, um, and the Silent does have a very good way to block. As the Silent in Slay the Spire, you start with 12 cards in your deck, five strikes, Five defends, one survivor, one neutralize. That's more or less five cards intended to deal damage and seven cards intended to reduce enemy damage, which means this character is very block heavy at the start. Silent has the lowest starting damage of all the characters, and that means that she'll spend the longest time in early combats before you have a, a, a damage plan. It also means that getting a damage plan as the Silent is, I think, extremely important. Most fights in Slay the Spire will get stronger over time. The longer the player sticks around in the combat, the more threatening the enemies become. So although the Silent has the tools to render enemies non-threatening initially, if she doesn't finish the encounters by actually dealing damage, then the fights will eventually become unmanageable. Looking at our starting bonuses here, we have a, a few unusual options. Transforming a card would allow us to take one of our starter cards and turn it into something random. That something random could be good or it could be bad, at least in the short term. No matter what you get with a transform, almost all cards in Slay the Spire have a, a use or a utility. So generally speaking, turning a starter card into a random card is quite positive. Taking this Nyao's Lament bonus, enemies in your next combat. Next three combats have one health. You'll often get presented this if you don't make it to the Act 1 boss on a previous run. And one thing that you can use this for is to fight an elite that has only a single hit point. Uh, and I see that the map that we've been given is capable of generating this kind of start for us here by pathing through these, let's mark this path in white here, using a mod called Map Marks to map the, to mark the map so I can indicate the path that we might take. So we could, for example, get either of these elites by avoiding combats initially. However, this will ultimately result in us seeing less card wards in Act 1 if we don't make up for it by taking fights after the elite. How would that work out for us? Could take a few combats afterwards. I particularly like this path over here. Hmm. And I could maybe get this one for free. Third option, take a curse for a rare relic. I generally advise against taking curses in Slay the Spire. On any run, especially a run that's seeking to defeat the heart, you'll want to get rid of as many of your starter cards as possible. A bit more on that later. The last and final option, one I won't be taking on this run for tutorial purposes. You can always trade your starting relic for a random boss relic. If, you're, if you've tried a few runs uh, attempting to defeat the heart and have failed up to this point, I might recommend giving this a shot. Um, this is a high-risk, high-reward play that can work out very well if you get a very 
powerful or useful boss relic early, or can simply make a run very strong by virtue of having three boss relics by the end. But uh, the shift to your starting play can be a bit dramatic. For this run, I think we are going to take the Niao's Lament. I... I think this will allow us to take a very favorable path to the act. So let me let me clear off the marking here and talk a little bit more about pathing in general. What does your path through Act 1 want to look like as the silence? You have to commit to a starting location on the map as your second choice. We are going to lock this in here. Your second choice of the run has to be which node to start with. and. The path that you intend to take through the whole act is going to be influenced by this starting decision. So taking a few minutes at the start of your run, at the start of each act rather, to scrutinize the map, I think is a, a very, very good practice in Slay the Spire. The goal of each act is to strengthen your deck of cards. This is a, a deck building game. So the goal here is build the deck to be better and better as much as possible. And in Slay the Spire, you have a few main ways to do that. First way is by directly adding cards to the deck via card rewards. We get these from regular combats, um, which drop card rewards of normal rarity, and from elite combats, which drop card rewards of higher rarity. You're more likely to see rare cards from elite nodes. When you beat a boss, you get a guaranteed rare card reward as well, of course. The other way we can improve the deck is by upgrading the cards that we have, upgrading them at rest sites. Every card in Slay the Spire has an upgrade that improves its numerical value in some way, usually upgrading either the block or the damage it does, sometimes increasing the duration of status effects like Neutralize, or it can also decrease the cost of the card. Accumulating upgrades is very, very important in Slay the Spire, and a metric that I often use to think about my decks is upgrade density, essentially the proportion of cards in your deck that are upgraded versus unupgraded. Another way that you can improve your deck of cards in Slay the Spire is to remove cards. It might not be immediately apparent why removing a card is a good thing, but taking the previous concept of upgrade density, if we say have two upgraded cards in a 10 card deck, then we have a 20% upgrade density. You can improve the upgrade density by either upgrading an existing card, or you can remove an unupgraded card. Remove two cards, two, co two upgraded cards in an 8-card deck, that's 25% of the cards are now upgraded. You'll also draw those two upgraded cards more frequently if cards have been removed. So card removals are also a, a very important way for deck improvement to occur, and across this run we're going to be looking to remove, in particular, the five starting strikes, which I highly recommend getting rid of on this character, specifically the Silent. Silent doesn't have a whole lot of ways to make these strike cards more useful than just deal six damage, um, and Silent does have numerous ways to make her starting defense better than just five block. So for that reason, the Silent tends to prefer keeping blocks over, uh, keeping defense over strikes. You can also improve your deck of cards in Slay the Spire indirectly via relics, which will appear up here on our relic bar. Every elite we kill gives us a relic. In the middle of each act, there are relics in the treasure chests. And we can also find relics in event rooms and purchase them with money from stores. Stores can indirectly provide cards, relics, and card removals all in exchange for gold, which we get in large from normal combats and from elites. Sometimes you get money from events, but mostly gold is a consistent stream of income from every fight you get. So with all those things considered, what are the best ways to improve your deck by going through an act of Slay the Spire? And generally speaking, I have come to value elite and rest site nodes the most. Elites because they give you money and card rewards and relics. All of these things are very important and rest sites because they allow you to improve the existing cards that you have. So with these factors considered, I'm looking at a path something like this. Well, maybe this. Uh, our exact path will be determined by the contents of our first few event rooms. But the idea here is that we... Well, I'll mark that for the moment. We shouldn't have to fight this first elite here, as long as our first combat is this fight, our second combat is this fight, our third combat will be this elite. So we should beat this elite for one health. Then we can fight another elite to get a relic, get several upgrades, 
one more elite for a third relic and go into the boss with three relics and four upgrades from four rest sites. That'll be pretty generous. Again, again, that's going to be slightly contingent on the Niao's Lament working or not. But even if we don't get the first elite for free, we should be able to either um, make the deck strong enough to defeat the elites conventionally, or we can change our path. Let's mark this in white, our option of we got a combat here or here with Niao's Lament. All right, so let's embark. Uh, yeah, another option would be to path through the store here to go through one less event room. Events have an increasing chance to be a combat as you go through more of them. Your first event is 10% chance to be a fight. The second one, if it was the first one wasn't a fight, is 20% and so on. So for one combat in two event rooms is pretty unlikely. We'll start here. We get to defeat the first combat pretty easily. Something I could have talked about with a, a different starting bonus here is Silent's starting matchup versus the initial combats. The Silent is very well positioned to defeat the early fights of Act 1 without taking very much damage. Your starting Ring of the Snake means you'll draw a good mixture of strikes and defends on turn 1 of every fight, and the 8 block of Survivor plus the weak of the Neutralize is really good at mitigating damage from any enemy, even the Jaw Worm. So even without Niao's Lament, I think as Silent, you should be able to defeat your early combats with very little damage taken. The only thing I would strongly advise against is um, blocking with a defend when it's only going to block for one damage. Do not seek to always block every single point of damage headed your way. In Slay the Spire, your health has to be used efficiently and effectively. So if Taking one damage allows you to play an extra strike against an, en an enemy. I usually advocate for that. So, Silent Starting Deck needs help doing damage. I highly recommend picking up a few damage cards as your first couple of picks from the Silent. We've got an interesting set of three before us. Flying Knee deals eight damage one time and gives energy back the next turn versus slice six damage immediately but no upfront energy cost. Both kind of like zero energy for the damage they deal, with Flying Knee being a little bit more efficient in order, uh, but requiring you to, uh, to wait a turn to get the energy back. The other option here is a damage power called Infinite Blades, giving us one shiv per turn. In our run as the Silent, we're going to have to formulate a plan for ultimately figuring out how to escalate our damage over the course of the run. Here at the start, we can play three strikes to deal 18 damage in one turn, um, but by the end of the run, we're going to need to be able to deal hundreds of damage in a handful of turns. By the end of the game, you're generally looking to do about 800 damage across seven turns is the approximate, so a little bit more than 100 damage per turn. That's a lot more than we currently do with the starting deck, so there's a long, long, long way to go, but thankfully a lot of game ahead of us. As the Silent, you have a couple main ways to deal damage. The first way is directly with attack cards. That's what your starting deck has with the strikes, and that's what we're offered here in this card award. The second way is with the status effect called Poison. Poison deals damage equal to the number of stacks of poison and then decreases by one. The idea with the poison cards is that since you can redraw and play the same poison cards over and over, you can increase the number of poison stacks on enemies the longer the fight goes on. So against higher health opponents, poison cards allow you to do an increasing amount of damage over time. They're essentially Silent's natural answer to the bosses of the Spire, but not her only answer. All this to say... I think any of these three are actually acceptable. All of them do improve the, the damage of Silence. Infinite Blades is a kind of a slow way to get there. A card I usually don't have a like for, um, because it doesn't do a lot of damage per turn. The way I like to think of Infinite Blades is four damage per turn, starting the turn after you play it. So it takes several turns for it to deal as much damage as something like Flying Knee. But there are a lot of interactions and synergies you can get for this. I'm going to give it a go here. I think Infinite Blades is an improvement to the Silence starting deck and can be a valuable card in the long term, at least on the, the lower ascensions here. 
Flying Knee would probably be my my usual recommendation in this situation, but ultimately any of these three cards are are takeable here. Let's see what we can do with a fl with an Infinite Blades on floor one. I'm actually rather curious how that's going to uh, turn out. Where our next uh, event is uh, a rather unusual one, the Match and Keep. This gremlin offers us 12 cards, 12 mystery cards, behind which are hidden six pairs of cards that match. On this difficulty level, there will be one pair of Neutralize card, one pair of a random common silent card, one uncommon silent card, and one rare silent card, as well as one, I believe, uncommon colorless card. First card we see is Unload, a pretty good damaging rare for Silent. I'm curious if we can find the other copy of that, as that would be a really good addition to the deck. Generally speaking, if you don't want to add the card that's being revealed in this event, then you should not click on a card you haven't seen yet. Bane deals damage twice if the enemy has poison. I'm willing to add a Bane randomly. We see Shame, so we won't get matched to the curse there. There's the other Unload. I think we should take it. I think Unload and Infinite Blades together will really help our uh, damage. Definitely not the my usual picks for Silent, but I like it. You know, the other Shame is here, so I can look at a new card. It's the other Bane. We could now add Bane, but let's look at one last new card. Neutralize. No, thank you. So we have one Unload. Unload is much better than our Strike, stealing 14 instead of 6, which is a, a dramatic improvement here. The fact that it discards all of the non-attack cards in our hand is pretty, uh, pretty interesting. I don't know if we'll find it useful. We randomly encounter a shop here. This means my plan to go along the green path is... is a go. What's in the shop? Every time we visit a shop, we'll see two attacks, two skills, and one power in the top row. That's the layout of every shop, plus, of course, three relics, two colorless cards, and the card removal. Hmm. We're also going into another shop next floor, so we might not want to consider spending any money here. But of the options available, there's several good picks. Both Dagger Spray and Eviscerate would be pretty good damage additions. Eviscerate and Unload can actually work well together. Catalyst, if we find other poison cards, could be an amazing long-term strategy. Catalyst is one of the best ways to uh, defeat specifically the heart by stacking a huge amount of poison. Since we have Shivs and an Unload already, I'm actually eyeing Trip here. The Vulnerable Status effect makes Physical attacks deal 50% more damage, and I think that that could really help the both the starting deck and the infinite blades unload. Already getting most of a mo getting us most of the way there towards uh, dealing with Act One. So let's take a trip here. I actually quite like that. Last reasonable option: remove a strike. I think that'd be very good in, as well. But let's take the trip. I'm gonna buy the trip. What's in the next shop? Some pretty good block cards. I think Backflip and Dark Shackles are both pretty good in the early game. None of the relics would be in our price range. Another thing to consider in early stores is uh, potions. Buying a potion from a shop in the first few floors can really gear you up for a first elite combat. But of course, nothing that we can do here. We're passing through this shop simply so that we can have an elite fight with one hit point. And that's exactly what's going to happen. This poor cultist is going to get cacawed. Oh, excellent. So this is actually all three of the, the block types. So, how do you block as the silent? How does silent stay alive and mitigate enemy damage? There are essentially three different ways that this character has to stay alive. Um, on all three of them are effective in kind of different circumstances. The first way that you can mitigate enemy damage as this character is, of course, to block directly with a block card like Survivor. You get a flat amount of block. This is great for enemies that are attacking for medium to small amounts. You simply trounce their damage and, and play whatever damage cards you have. But if enemies are attacking for more damage than that, 
blocking might not be enough. Enter the weak status effect. Weak reduces enemy damage by percentage, 25%. And there's a relic this character can find that increases that to 40%. Since it's a percentage reduction, the more en the more damage the enemies are attacking for, the more the weakness will block for. Uh, the later into the run you get, the more damage enemies will attack for. So the later into the run you get, the better the weak status effect becomes. There's also... Strength reduction. You can reduce the strength of your enemies, which causes them to deal one less damage Per point of strength they have reduced. This is more effective against enemies that attack multiple times, and there's quite a few of those later in the run, including, of course, the Corrupt Heart, who we're trying to tutorialize the defeat of here. I think, generally speaking, blocking effectively as the Silent means combining all three of these in one way or another. There's also, of course, um, the intangible status effects, which Silent can get from one of her cards and one of her potions, which reduces enemy damage all the way down to one, but that's pretty hard to find. Most silent runs can assemble a heart-defeating package out of the combination of weakness, block, and strength reduction. Uh, and I think here for Act 1, an early Leg Sweep is a really good pickup here. Leg Sweep is one of the highest block value block cards the silent has with 11 block and weak attached to it at the same time means it's really effective block for any situation i actually quite like that paired with our offense that we've added so far so now we get to tackle an elite for free here this first elite has one health i think against this fight we would otherwise be okay here because the one shiv per turn combined with our pretty high value block cards would allow us to uh, to get through with not too much trouble. But as it is, we don't have to fight them for realsies, meaning we just harvest some free money, a relic called the boot thingy, no, the anchor, which gives us 10 block on turn one, and another card reward, which contains blur, which can allow us to retain block. This can be a very... Very useful card later on. Kind of like it alongside the uh, the block on turn one, actually, as it could allow us to retain that block initially. Expertise is a sort of uh, fancy draw card. I like to call this uh, draw manipulation in some ways. The more card, less cards you have in your hand, the more cards expertise will draw. So it pairs ideally with the the discard engine that this character has. Draw and discard effects like. Prepared and dagger throw and such. Lastly, finisher hits for every attack played this turn. That works nicely with the infinite blades. Uh, and since we can already make our foes vulnerable, I think there's an argument here for incorporating finisher. Finisher is a kind of funky attack card, but really rewards um, having lots of attacks to play. Interesting. I could also reasonably see skipping all three of these. But I think this finisher could become quite useful, given that we've already got infinite blades and trip. Let's do it. Six damage for each attack played this turn. And then we get to get we get to choose our first upgrade. The upgrade on the infinite blades makes it innate, guaranteeing that we draw turn one. Since we have free block turn one, that would be reasonable, actually, to lock in getting these shivs as early as possible. Other good upgrades, plus four damage on unload. Generally speaking, I advocate upgrading the highest numerical upgrades in your deck first. Like the the. So if we compare, for example, strike upgrade, six to nine is plus three damage. Unload upgrade is 14 to 18, plus 4 damage. That's a, a better upgrade. Generally speaking, you also want to upgrade the best cards in your deck rather than trying to improve the average quality towards any um, specific level. When you play a turn of Slay the Spire, you're looking at 5 or 7 cards and you're picking the best 3 usually to play. Uh, because you only play some of your cards and not all of them, you want to make sure that the cards that you are playing are hitting as 
hard as possible. So upgrade your best cards, not your worst. Uh, Leg Sweep's another very good upgrade, improving both the weakness and the block. I think that'll be one of our early upgrade choices. That's the more defensive choice. Maybe that should be our second upgrade. With uh, Unload being first. Or Finisher would hit for two more per attack. I'm going to upgrade the Unload first for the plus four damage. This will be the bulk of our damage here in the early game and should let us through some early encounters, such as perhaps the Gremlin Knob. Gremlin Knob here is one of the most threatening of the elites in Act 1 for the Silence. This angry boy buffs himself with the Enrage buff, which will cause him to gain strength every time we play a skill outside of turn 1. Usually a very threatening opponent for the Silence. Uh, and because this guy exists, I, especially on Silent, recommend making sure your first few cards improve the damage of your deck. I also recommend cards that can weaken the Gremlin Knob, because those can also substantially reduce the damage this guy does. But we're going to find that with the trip and our strikes, we should be able to lower his health substantially. Next turn, we'll have to make choice about uh, whether we play attacks or skills. It's all up to what we draw. Unfortunately, we didn't find the unload, but we do draw two strikes and the finisher card. So we could play strike plus strike plus finisher. That would deal 9 plus 9 plus 18, 36 damage, leaving the Gremlin Knob at 24 health. Which is exactly the damage we deal with Strike and Unload next turn. Generally speaking, at the start of each turn of Slay the Spire, highly recommend taking a look at the cards that are in your draw pile, because it informs you of what you're going to be drawing on a future turn. Uh, especially, especially if you have exactly five cards in the draw pile, like we do here, because then you know exactly what you're going to draw. And it does indeed look like this works out just cleanly for us. Might be tempting to block here, playing the defend to mitigate some damage, but this will only make the Grumladov angry, giving a, him two more strength. And since we've realized that we need exactly all of the damage that we have, we shouldn't play any non damaging card there. That way our strike and our unload plus very cleanly kill this gremlin knob. Not too bad. Not too bad at all. We find our first potion. Potions are a very, very useful resource in Slay the Spire. My recommendation is uh, I, I like to, when a potion drops, kind of think about specifically what that potion is for. And in this deck, being able to add Vulnerable is something we want to do in a fight where we need lots of damage, but don't draw the trip early or don't have the trip in hand at the right turn. Usually I'm saving potions for my elite battles and trying to collect them from my regular fights, but it can be that they make a difference in the regular fights too. Three more attack cards offered to us. I actually would not mind a dagger throw in this situation. Generally speaking, I do advocate for Dagger Throw over Quick Slash. Quick Slash deals one less, draws one, but doesn't discard one. Actually, discarding a card on Silent can be a beneficial thing, as it allows you to get rid of unwanted statuses and allows you to interact with some relics on this character that are useful for draw discard. So I'm going to pick up a Dagger Throw here. We're pretty much at the, the limit of how many cards we should be adding in the early game. I usually don't advocate that you add more than about five cards in Act 1. Um, something that is easy to do incorrectly and uh, can lead to your demise is adding too many cards to your deck in Slay the Spire. Uh, on the Silent in particular, very strong advice, do not add too many attack cards common cards, or don't add too many attack cards, period, realistically, if those don't draw cards. Um, too many copies of things like Quick Slash, Rill with Holes, Sucker Punch, Finisher, Slice, Dagger Spray, etc. can leave you with hands that are able to dispatch regular combats, but are just completely useless against the bosses of the Spire and will leave you crippled in the late game. All right, we get to our mid-act chest here. At some point during the run, we'll have to choose to take a sapphire key rather than the relic we're presented in the chest, but that's not going to be here and now. We're offered an ink bottle, which says whenever we play 10 cards, draw one card. The more cards you can play, the better that becomes. 
And with a card like Finisher, we want to be able to combo our cards as best as possible. So drawing more cards is ideal. I actually think this is quite good with our infinite blades, adding one shiv per turn. At least it ought to be. All right, we face down the jaw worm. We're almost done with the act one easy pool. Your first three encounters in act one come from an easier subset of encounters that we call the easy pool. I'm gonna choose to weaken this thing so that it does less damage next turn. Play one of our strikes. Our next encounter will be a bit more challenging. We can play all of this. Important that we play Unload last, since Unload will discard the other two cards. We want to defend, Infinite Blades, Unload here. And then here we could do plenty of damage with uh, Shiv and Finisher. Ideally, we want to play exactly two cards, so that when the combat ends, the Ink Bottle is on nine. That means, since the number on this relic persists from one fight to the next, it behooves us to uh, to start with uh, with nine, so that the first time we play a card, we draw a card. We're offered the power accuracy, which improves the damage dealt by shiv cards. We do have one shiv generator already. The infinite blades makes one shiv per turn. This would improve the damage of each of those shivs individually. Generally speaking, I don't recommend accuracy until you have two or more shiv cards. But this could be a way for us to improve our damage in the long term. If we pick up the accuracy power and then pick up more shiv generating cards, which we already want to go with the finisher and the ink bottle, um, then we can, we can do well. So the direction we're going in here, silent-wise, is... Uh, is the Shiv cards, it looks like. This is one of the card packages this character has access to. There are quite a few cards that create Shivs, zero cost attacks that deal four damage, and a number of ways to boost the damage dealt by the Shivs. Finisher will reward us for playing lots of Shivs, Trip makes the Shivs more damaging, and Accuracy makes the Shivs more damaging. Combine these together, and we have what I like to refer to as Damage Scaling, a way to deal lots and lots more damage over time. I think I am going to take this Accuracy, and then we're going to commit to picking up pretty much whatever the next Shiv card we see is, be it a Cloak and Nagger, or a Blade Dance, or dare I say it, even another copy of Infinite Blades. And we're going to see how that works for damage. I think we're also going to now upgrade our Leg Sweep to further improve our block before I start further investing in our damage. Other damage upgrades that I think are good. I'm not going to upgrade Accuracy until we actually do find another Shiv card. It might be tempting to, to kind of build aspirationally towards a deck that you want to have, but in Slay the Spire, your focus is very much needs to be on the short term. So you must pick cards that have immediate interactions that actually do work together. Uh, or you'll fall behind very quickly. Alright, we're facing down the lice. This should be pretty easy with the Unload Plus here. Unload Plus kills one of these things outright. The boot thingy is blocking, so I think I'm going to kill the 14 health one in the front. I'll strike the middle one. And we should play one card just to increment Ink Bottle by one, even though I can't play anything meaningful. Let's strike this one. But on this turn, we can... what? Cannot kill this one? Funny, the middle one uh, debuffed us twice there in a row. It's a rule that they can't do that on uh, High Ascension, but I forgot that they could on Low Ascension. This will only strike one time, so there's no killing the back louse. Guess that means we're killing the front one. So we block for five, take two, that's fine. Um, This. We'll play that into the blades eventually, I swear. It's mostly useful for longer fights. So, could end the fight immediately with Strike, but we want to set up Ink Bottle to 9 here. So we should play the Neutralize or the Accuracy first. Get a second potion. A Strength potion improves our damage per hit. That could be very useful in a fight where we need a little bit more damage. So perhaps this Elite or perhaps our boss. All right, I said we take the next Shiv card we see. Here's a Cloak and Dagger. 
Cloak and Dagger gives block and adds one or upgraded two shivs to our hand. So I think what I'm going to do is take the Cloak and Dagger, then we're going to upgrade the Cloak and Dagger for two shivs, and we're going to upgrade the Accuracy to give us more damage per shiv, and that should start to work together pretty well, actually. So, three sentries. This is a game of killing one or two of them as quickly as you can. I usually advocate focusing the front or the back one. Uh, because that way you're only going to be taking 10 damage per turn rather than 10, then 20, 10, then 20. If you kill the middle one first, you'll take 0, then 20, and that's a lot harder to block than 10 every turn. Both the front and the back have equal health, so all of the things being equal, I'll just target the first, the front one. And we do draw our infinite blades turn one. Let's get that in play here. This is the, this is the first fight where this is actually going to pay off. I think we can keep our strength potion to the boss at minimum here. So we'll just deal some damage to the front one. The second turn might be a little tricky for us. We do draw a finisher along with three other attacks, so we can make the finisher deal. 18 damage. One, two, three. As long as we play all of them. So 18 plus 6 equals 24. We want to strike the front one, play the other attacks on a different one. Let's target the back one next, as it has the second least stealth. And then finisher will kill the front one here, and we can block for five. Our accuracy will make this shiv deal more damage. We're going to draw one more attack card here. If we trip the back one, we should be able to kill it this turn. And we play the defend, then, I imagine. Unload's going to deal 27, so shiv plus unload kills. Meaning I get to play defend. I should have played shiv before accuracy. That's all right. That's all right. And then I will play the Survivor just to make sure we can use the Ink Bottle to draw next turn. Or not. Okay. We get through the sentries without too much difficulty and find yet another relic. The more relics you can collect, the more powerful your run will be. And if you get enough of them, uh, you'll start to really overwhelm the enemies. An interesting set of three options here. Calc Gamble, Eviscerate, and Noxious Fumes. Our first real poison card that we're offered. We've built a lot of damage that isn't poison at this point. And so I think to go poison is a mistake here. So I, I would not be taking fumes at this point, generally speaking. As the silent, your damage can come and perhaps even should come from multiple sources. It's it's not an exclusive or you're not going shivs or poison necessarily. The two can work together since they're kind of effective against different targets. But I believe with the accuracy that we have, we should be good for longer fights. And so I don't think we need a noxious fumes. Eviscerate can work pretty well with the unload here and would go nicely alongside the dagger throw too is a, a big way to do chunky damage. But I think my recommended pick here is Calculated Gamble, allowing us to discard a hand of cards and draw a new. That's a good way to sift through the starter cards of your silent deck, um, or just to gamble away a bunch of block cards that you don't have a use for. A very, very useful uh, card, especially as you get later on into a run. I almost always recommend one or two gambles for a silent deck. We got a nice generous heal from our Eternal Feather. Generally speaking, before the, there's always a rest site before the boss. Um, I would highly recommend making it a practice to try to upgrade before your boss fight whenever possible. It might be tempting to rest for extra health, but you do heal for free after defeating the boss if you're able to do so. And accumulating more upgrades in your deck will definitely help you get a victory. In this case, I'm going to upgrade Accuracy, making our Shivs do more damage to... That should make them do a full 10 damage each. 
uh, 15 with Vulnerable from Trip, which will help us break through the Guardian's large amount of health. I think we'll probably also leverage our Strength Potion for a little bit more advantage here. The Guardian is a rather complicated fight. Let's talk for a moment about this thing. Using the Beast Jury mod here, I can bring up the AI of the Guardian. And look at that attack pattern. There's seven different things the Guardian can do. This boss has a, a sort of rotating attack pattern that they trend towards. So their, their base moveset is as follows. Charge up, bash, vent steam, whirlwind. That's any time they're in the bipedal humanoid mode, which you should strive to keep them out of at all times. This boss's special mechanic is that they can shift forms, kind of curling up into an onion-like object covered in sharp spikes whenever you deal enough damage to them. Which you should do, because their attacks are much harder hitting when they're in their upright form. So the goal for this fight is usually deal enough damage to transform, only 30 damage required to transform this boss on the lower difficulties. Um, and then you have to spend turns blocking when they curl up. After dealing the 30 damage, they'll... Wherever they are in this initial attack pattern, they'll swap to the Roll Attack Twin Slam for two defensive mode turns, and then reappear in the bipedal form at the Whirlwind. So then going Whirlwind, Charge Up, Fierce Bash, Vent Steam. During those turns, it's our block cards that are going to keep us alive, because any attack you play against Guardian while they're curled up will deal three damage back to you. So that is going to make our shivs a bit of a problem. But we're drinking this Strength Potion for the two additional damage per attack. And we're going to unleash Fury on this boss. Let's see, we could consider playing the Leg Sweep to weaken them. We're likely to draw enough damage to transform next turn. There's almost no non-attack cards there, so I think we should do that. Let's get the early Cloak and Dagger here, play the Leg Sweep and weaken them. Yeah, Trip. Plus Strike, plus Strike will transform, meaning we can play the Accuracy. And very imperative that you do enough damage to Guardian by turn two to avoid that initial attack. And we will also play our Infinite Blades, giving us one shoot per turn. So here's where playing an attack will cause us to take damage back. Might be tempting to play Unload here for 30, but we'll take 4 in return. Rather preserve my health and simply block for now. Likewise, playing the Shivs during these turns will cause us to take additional damage. So this Shiv I'm simply going to discard by not playing it. Allow it to go to the discard pile at end of turn. We'll draw it on a future turn, but that's okay. And we have to take some damage here. Alright, now it's our turn to hit back. Guardian will no longer punish us for playing attacks, so it's time to play a ton of them. And we'll draw the extra card next turn. Get leg swept. I can even play the unload here. Three damage per, per attack we play. Might have said that wrong earlier. Local error and survivor makes 14 blocks. That's almost enough block to let us play a shiv. I mean, we play one shiv and take one damage. That's not too bad. Reducing the Guardian's overall health is somewhat important here. Okay, and this trip should allow us to again do enough damage that the uh, boss is simply transformed here. Just like that, the boss is pretty much out of health. The shivs with the bonus from the accuracy and the bonus from the vulnerable are doing quite substantial damage. Alright, that's our first boss conquered. I suspect we could have even done that without using the Strength Potion, but using the Strength Potion made it very decisively in our favor. What a set of options here. Two X cost cards before us. Doppelganger, which is next turn draw and energy as well as Malaise, which is minus strength to an enemy. 
Lastly, there's Corpse Explosion, which applies poison to an enemy, and then when that enemy dies, all enemies will take damage equal to the enemy's health. Essentially, when one enemy dies, kill them all. Corpse Explosion can be a very nice, it's a very um, appropriately splashable poison card. That is, it's a poison card that's good even if you're not running other poison cards, because the secondary effect is exceedingly useful for doing things like um, killing two bosses at the same time, or clearing out a a wave of gremlins. That said, I'm also a very large fan of the Malaise card. Malaise as an X cost strength reducer is one of Silent's better ways to deal with very damaging late game enemies, particularly late game bosses, are quite vulnerable to this card as they often have multi-attacking moves that are very, very less threatening if you can both reduce their strength and weaken them. The malaise plus the leg sweep gives us very permeate, uh, not permeate, near permanent weak status on almost any enemy. Very much like this against heart especially, so uh, I'm very strongly considering the malaise here, and I think it is one of the best cards available. But Corpse Explosion would help for what's coming here in Act 2. Act 2 is an act that requires you to have very good block as well as... The ability to do quite a bit of damage quickly. Uh, and you're also presented with multi-enemy threats constantly. So Corpse Explosion can be quite good for that. But I think I am going to go with Malaise for the Strength Reduction. Do highly recommend Corpse Explosion going into Act 2 in general. Alright, our first boss relic reward. Picking your boss relic at the end of Act 1 can be one of the most difficult things in Slay the Spire. Sometimes you're offered three very similar relics, sometimes you're offered three radically different relics. Sometimes you're offered energy, sometimes you're not. Generally speaking, it's a game of figuring out which relic is the most upside to you, while also considering what the possible downsides are. So, of these options... We're offered three different relics that improve our energy per turn. Sozu says, gain energy every turn, but we can no longer obtain potions. Potions, to me, are very valuable resources on a heart run. I think they're very important for for figuring out how to, uh, how to emerge victorious in the long term. Um, and they specifically give you aid against one very difficult fight, which is what the heart is. The Velvet Choker gives us energy every turn, but limits us to not more than six cards per turn, which definitely shuts down any attempt to make the Finisher, the Cloak and Dagger, or Shivs in general good. Very much works against the Ink Bottle, too. Do not recommend taking Velvet Choker here at all. Lastly, the Coffee Dripper prevents us from resting at rest sites. Doesn't mean that we can't heal, just means we cannot heal by resting, taking the rest action. Generally speaking, that's something you'd like to avoid doing, since upgrades are better, but healing is pretty useful a lot of the time. I usually don't recommend a Coffee Derper unless you already have a relic that can heal you, and guess what? We have an Eternal Feather here, which says when we visit a rest site, specifically where the Coffee Derper's penalty kicks in, we heal anyway. So, we already heal at rest sites, I don't need to heal twice at rest sites, let's just take this energy. Note that with Sozu, you can't gain new potions, but you can use any that you already have. So the best time for me to take a Sozu is when I have three potions already. If you're still unsure how to use or best utilize your potions, taking a Sozu can be pretty good. Because it lets you kind of forget about that resource that you're not figuring out how to use anyway. But I highly encourage figuring out how to make the best use of your potions and taking other boss relic options. We'll take that Coffee Dripper. We'll find that one more energy per turn is very, very useful here. It means we can malaise for more energy. It means we can more easily play our powers and our blocks. It means we're going to draw cards from the ink bottle more frequently. So on and so forth. Here in Act 2... Your goals are a little bit different than they were in Act 1. Now that we've already have some upgraded cards, upgrades aren't quite as valuable, although we might have a few specific ones we'd like to still upgrade, such as perhaps this malaise. 
Starting in Act 2, I think card removals become a lot more valuable. You want to get rid of the starter cards that your deck has, and so going to shops to do that can become very useful. I think we could fight a lot of elites this act if we wanted to. If you have a lot of money in Act 2, which you are much more likely to, since you just got a, a whole bunch of money from beating the Act 1 boss, an early shop becomes a lot more valuable. So usually in Act 2, I'm looking to go to shops. I'm looking to hit a couple of fires, and I'd like to fight elites, but the elites of Act 2 are super spooky. There's three different elites in Act 2. The first one is the Gremlin Leader, who will summon waves of Gremlin minions. This is a big test on your ability to do damage every turn, ideally to multiple different foes. We don't have any attacks that can hit multiple enemies, but we do have lots of little small attacks, and that can deal with Gremlin Leader pretty well. The second one is the Three Slavers, three medium health enemies that attack you relentlessly. For that fight, you want block on turn one, and you want to be able to kill one enemy very quickly, so you want a couple high damage attacks. I think we actually have what it takes to take that fight down. The last and perhaps most difficult of the three elites is the Book of Stabbing, a single chunky enemy that stabs you with a multi-attacking move over and over again. And that's an enemy that the malaise can really, really weaken. So for those reasons, this deck has tools that can answer all three of the elites in Act 2, and that means we have the ability to um, fight a whole bunch of elites. I'm thinking no matter what we should do, we should start by going to a shop. Then we can, we can see if we can spend some of this 270 gold to any use, and at minimum we can remove one of our starter cards, which is important. From this fire, we can decide whether we want to go to more shops or whether, whether we want to start fighting elites. It's all going to depend on what we spent our money on in that first store. We'll take one event along the way to the shop. All right, these tough customers, the two thieves, they are a, a consistently difficult entry to act to, these two. And if you don't have relics that help, um, or if you're not willing to use a potion, they can really take a lot of health off of you. If you saved any potions from Act 1, this could be a really good fight to spend them on, because it's quite difficult to get through this combat without losing too much health. I've started to recommend targeting the back one, because they... They have very similar health, and the back one will do more damage on turn 3, if they choose to attack on turn 3. But sometimes they just run away. Let's see, I'd like to draw different cards, so I think we're just going to calculate a gamble the starter hand here, looking for Leg Sweep, looking for Cloak and Dagger, looking for Trip here. We'd ideally want to kill the back one and block the front one this turn. Looks like we'll just block. Works for me. All right, front guy is dead. Uh, back guy is dead next turn, so we'll weaken the front one. That's a full block, so we can play the infinite blades. And even though we have no energy, we can still play the malaise. This doesn't have any effect, but it does cause the card to exhaust, which prevents us from drawing it again. And it makes the ink bottle increase its number by one. Both of these effects are desirable in this situation. Okay. Now we want to kill them both before they run away and take our money with them. Let's see what we can do. Shivs do 15. So two shivs to kill you. I'll dagger throw this one. Litter might be getting away here. Nope. And play the defense because of the ink bottle. Okay, so we managed to get all our money back. We're offered three cards. Act 2 is the first act in which you can be offered upgraded cards. Um, by default, the base is 25% chance per card in Act 2, and in Act 3 it'll be 50% chance per card. Strongly recommend considering cards that are already upgraded, and I think Backflip here is excellent because it's both good block and because it's card draw. Now that we have more than three energy per turn, drawing more cards becomes desirable so that we can play more total cards. And the fact that this is also attached to some pretty good block, eight block, is uh, very, very desirable. Might be tempting to take another Cloak and Dagger here, but I wouldn't recommend it unless this were upgraded. A beggar approaches us. Could rob him to gain a relic for free. Or we could pay out for a relic here. 
because we have the Darkstone Pyriap Relic, if we choose to rob this man, we will gain some maximum health in addition to the free relic. But then we'll have a curse that we'd want to remove at the shop. Which is about what this would cost. Thing is, uh, making card removals more expensive lasts for the whole run. That said, I do value max health a lot. Let's rob this man. Have you no shame? Oh, we get uh, we get one of the relics that really, really enable the shiv strategy on the silent, the kunai. Kunai says if we play three attacks in one turn, we gain a point of dexterity. And this is absolutely a relic around which you can build a, an entire deck on this character. Play lots of attacks to gain dexterity, and then your blocks will block for huge amounts. And we're already well positioned to take advantage of this with Cloak and Dagger, Backflip, and Infinite Blades. So I think this is a very good find for us. <laughs> that does make a second copy of Cloak and Dagger a lot more appealing now that we do have the Kunai. It's also a second copy of Accuracy here. Other things that could be good, there's Orange Pellets. If you play a power attack and skill on the same turn, remove all your debuffs. This could be a very good long-term relic, um, because there are a few late-game enemies that apply debuffs, in particular, of course, the Corrupt Heart, who we're looking to defeat. Can we afford Cloak and Dagger card remove Orange Pellets? Because I would like to do that. I think we can. Twenty-seven plus seventy-five plus. Here, let me shrink down so you can see the removal cost. Is seventy-five. I'm small now. Plus one fifty-five. Two fifty-seven. Yeah, so we can afford we can afford all three of these, and that's what I would strongly recommend here. Very easy to underestimate this relic, but its effect is quite useful. Remove all of your debuffs. That means vulnerable, frail, weaken. And special things like Confusion or Hex from the Chosen Enemy. There's a lot of uses for this. Definitely want to get rid of the Curse, even though we can purge the, the debuff from it. Curses are something we don't want to keep around here. And we'll take another Shiv card. All right, these bird enemies are pretty easy for a deck like this to defeat. If you strike the same bird three times in one turn, they're knocked out of the air. And we can absolutely, absolutely do that. Let's knock this back one that's buffing. And rather than playing strikes, I'm going to gamble and look for finisher or something. Perfect. So, you're grounded, and we're going to reduce strength off of the front one. But it attacks for nothing. Recommend finishing the birds that are on the ground rather than trying to further damage the ones that are flying. When the birds are in air, they take half damage. So we could do... 5 plus 9 with Shiv Unload, or we can just kill the one that's on the ground here. It's my personal recommendation. Alright, buddy. It's your turn now. You chose to attack me, that sentenced you to death. Could have knocked that one out of the air too by playing the finisher, but we can do that this turn. Terror here is a way to apply a vulnerable outside of the trip. Terror lasts a lot longer. 99 meaning it lasts a whole fight. It can be a great damage multiplier. However, there's another good card here, the Deflect. Deflect is a free block card. It scales really well with Dexterity. And the more card draw you have, the better it is. Also very good with the Ink Bottle, since that helps too. I'm going to take this upgraded Deflect. I think we're then trending towards a very resilient block core for this deck. I think we're also going to be able to take several elites here. Seems highly likely. 
obtain a relic with a 50% chance to become cursed with writhe. Well, that curse would give me max health anyway. On higher ascension levels, this would be a 100% chance to be cursed. This would potentially put us behind one more card removal, which is still something we did, don't desire, but I do think more relics is going to help us achieve critical mass. And even if we get the curse, which we might not, um, we will gain more max health. So I'm going to do this. We do get the curse. We do get six max health, and we get a relic that says, prevent the first time we would lose health each combat. So we've taken two curses for relics. Normally not something that I advise, but because we're gaining a second benefit from the Darkstone Periapt, it's a bit more worthwhile. And because we have lots of card draw on this deck, we can, we can tolerate our strikes. These are the two reasons I'm tolerating curses uh, in a situation where I really wouldn't otherwise recommend. And we're going to keep upgrading our ability to create shivs by upgrading Cloak and Dagger. Since we have 82 out of 82 health, I have no fears whatsoever about engaging com in combat with this elite. And we do roll the Gremlin Leader. Summoning waves of minions. Against the Gremlin Leader, it's important to kill the Gremlins regularly because if two or more gremlins stay on the field, the gremlin leader will take that as an invitation to attack us. Something we really don't want. I really don't want to neutralize a mad gremlin because it's just going to get angry. Let's trip and neutralize you then. We get attacked anyway. However, we do draw malaise. Meaning we can reduce the strength of the gremlin leader here. I plead accuracy. It takes 30 damage to kill you. If I fear potion, then the two shivs will kill the front gremlin here. I think that's what we want to do. Nice leg sweep draw. I actually meant to play another attack there. Looks like we won't have to play the malaise. But we can actually go deflect and then unload for more damage. That's actually optimal here. Thank you, Ink Bottle, for making that turn a lot better. Still haven't found Infinite Blades. Let's use Calculated Gamble to fix that. There it is. Kind of a weak turn otherwise. But now that we've gotten all the powers in play, we should be able to make sure the Gremlins stay dead most of the time. Let's see. Shiv and Strike this one. Shiv, shiv, strike the other one. And then on non-gumlin non turns, we can take this as an invitation to attack the leader for quite a bit of damage. Not too bad. More we'll malaise as well. But we should have a victory this turn. Yeah. The quicker you can end a fight, the better. So that was our goal here. The strike here and the unload here, all to improve our ink bottle. But you can see that the deck is thoroughly trouncing the elites of the act. That's a combination of our extra energy per turn from the coffee dripper, as well as our huge collection now of upgraded cards. And those cards are only going to get more upgraded with a whetstone, which will upgrade two random attacks in the deck. Hopefully dagger throw, finisher, or neutralize. You can also consider adding another card that it is an attack card before you pick up the whetstone. So we could pick up finisher plus, dagger throw, or acrobatics. Highly recommend this acrobatics here. Now that we have four energy per turn, being able to draw more cards is gonna help us do things like find the trip again, um, make sure we get our finisher on the right turn, and more. So I'm going to take that Acrobatic. So it might be tempting to take another Finisher there, and I think you could get away with another Finisher, but we're not quite making enough attacks for Finisher to feel particularly good. The Whetstone does simply upgrade two strikes. That's a little unfortunate, but not the worst thing in the world by any means. We're also going to upgrade now the Malaise. I want, if our next Elite Fight is the Book of Stabbing, I want to be able to make sure that that enemy deals very, very little damage. 
I would recommend upgrading potentially acrobatics in this position as well for more card draw so we could find the deflect and such easier. And we could maybe start to think about upgrading infinite blades so that we get it on turn one. Something I haven't yet talked about is our act boss, this bronze automaton fellow deals uh, a lot of damage all at once, attacking every other turn. This deck should be pretty good at the Bronze Automaton fights, uh, particularly because we have the Fossilized Helix, which can potentially block the dreaded Hyper Beam. Sundial is energy whenever we shuffle the deck a few times. Deck's getting pretty large here, and I think we're going to add quite a few cards beside. So I'm going to choose to take the Sapphire Key, skip this Relic, and get one of the three keys we're going to need to go to Act 4. Another key that we're going to need is the key from the Burning Elite here, which we'll be grabbing by uh, grabbing this act, since I think we're in a good position to do so. The Burning Elite is a, a regular elite fight from the act, but also with an enhanced buff, either bonus health, bonus metallicize, or bonus regeneration. I'm going to upgrade this Infinite Blades. Let's do it. I want the shivs early, please. And it is indeed the Book of Stabbing is our second opponent. This is the opponent we upgraded our malaise for, the multi-attacking fiend. Great turn to get both our powers down, the infinite blades and the accuracy. We'll backflip for block as well, also to look at more cards. Could do accuracy, cloak and dagger, finisher. What's the last card here? Just a strike? I think we'll skip both of the cloak and dagger and finisher. Well, just the finisher, rather. Play infinite blades and the cloak here. We also would have gained a point of dexterity for playing the finisher. But I want that one shift per turn. Not going to use either the strength or dexterity potion in this fight. I think we should be fine, thanks to the power of the kunai. This turn's a bit awkward. I, Although I have four energy, I cannot play all four of these cards because both the Survivor and the Unload will discard each other, respectively, if they're the last two cards in hand. Next turn, the Book of Stabbing is going to attack for a single hit. Let me explain why. Let's look at their AI here. Book of Stabbing only has two things it can do. A multi-attack for seven times the turn count, starting on two. So seven times two, then seven times three. And a single attack for 24. The multi-attack cannot be used three times in a row. Last turn, the Book of Stabbing attacked, attacked for seven times two. This time for base of seven times three. That's multi-attack twice in a row. Next turn will be a single attack. And we would like our buffer to block that for us. So I'm going to not play the unload here. We're going to full block by playing defend, defend, survivor. And we have buffer to block this now. Although it looks like we don't end up needing it. Hopefully the top card is malaise or gamble. No luck. Okay. That's fine, though. We still get to keep the buffer, then. And that ain't too bad at all, actually. I'd say that's a good thing. This deck is blocking exceptionally well. These shivs are helping. So if we malaise the Book of Stabbing here, we reduce its strength by 5. 4 plus 1. Which brings it to a base attack damage value of 2, and then we can bring that down to 1. So if I malaise, it'll attack me for 1 times 4. What if I defend first? Block 6, we malaise for minus 4 strength. Brings it to a base of 3, 2 by 4. So I would take 0, ultimately, although I'd lose the buffer. Let's do that. Defend, then malaise. And I could gamble here. Let's do it. Draws 3 which might be a zero-cost card. We still haven't taken a hit here. And now the Book of Stabbing's attacks are permanently reduced in strength, thanks to that uh, malaise. Still no trip, though. Let's go Dagger Throw, Cloak and Dagger, and play three shivs. Next turn, we should be able to kill with the shiv damage. It's all going well. We get a second boot thing. The Horn Cleat is the complement to the Anchor. We get 10 block on turn one and now 14 block on turn two. I usually consider these very, very good relics. And we've built up a, a really good start to a winning heart run so far. 
But again, critical mass. The more relics you can get, the better. We might want to consider taking even more dexterity here. I do like having a third power so that we can activate orange pellets more reliably. And footwork scales a lot of our block cards very well, so there's definitely a good incentive to pick up a footwork here. Copy of Dash or another finisher are not too bad either, but yeah, let's take a footwork. Let's take a footwork. Power cards are uh, an, definitely an important piece of the puzzle when it comes to beating the heart, specifically. You're almost always going to want several, because the heart has such huge combat stats. You need to stack many per turn benefits in order to be able to, to defeat that fight. Do I unload here for 18, or do we gamble? This is one of the, one of the enemies... Oh no, we should keep the... There's two powers in the draw pile, we should keep them there. In this fight, we want to target the Cultist first, because this enemy will gain strength every turn. The Chosen's going to hex us, cursing us with a curse that will, on this turn, that will cause us to add a status card to the draw pile every time we play a non-attack card. But we can use our Orange Pellets Relic to remove this effect. So there it is, the Hex. Whenever you play a non-attack card, shuffle one dazed into your draw pile. If we play a power, then an attack, and then a skill. The orange pellets activate, and the Hex debuff is removed. We had to add two dazed in the first place to make that happen, but now we're cured for the rest of the fight. cleanly block that, too. This is working all too well. Collect now. We're up to a full potion belt of potions. We're offered another footwork. This one has an upgrade on it. Or another copy of Terror. As the deck gets larger and larger, I notice this trip is starting to fail to do the job adequately, so I'm considering adding a Terror here so that we can have constant vulnerable to make sure our attacks are always doing the best amount of damage. That said, a footwork that says plus on it is, is usually pretty good, but I don't think we want too many copies of this card, since we can already gain dexterity with the kunai. It's possible to end up in a situation where we have too much dexterity gaining cards, not enough actual blocking cards. You want to maintain a uh, delicate balance. I'm going to take that terror. Hey, didn't I just fight you? We face the Chosen again. This is an enemy you really have to be prepared for in Act 2, because they can appear quite a bit as well as their bird nerd companion. Some acro here. I'm looking for, yeah, good blocks, and there's some. If we malaise the bird, it can never harm a soul. Ever. And now that the bird is harmless, we'll focus our damage on the Chosen. So we'll take the Chosen out first in this one. Sure can do a lot of damage with those shivs. This is only one copy of accuracy. Two or more copies of accuracy? Oh boy. The damage gets really absurd. Move that curse as well. Offered more upgraded card draw and block with another backflip, which I think is very, very good. Tactician gives us energy if discarded. We can discard it with dagger throw, with unload, or with survivor, or acrobatics, or calculated gamble. That's enough sources of discard that we could make this work. Tactician and cards like it are a way to gain tons of benefit without actually playing cards, just by leveraging the discard that you already have in your deck. That can be pretty good. I think this is a very takeable tactician, but a very, very good backflip. Not sure which one I want. I, I think the backflip is the more reliable pick here, but they're both good. 
If we see another upgraded tactician, which is very unlikely, or even another tactician period, I'll probably probably consider taking it. All right, the three slavers, we ended up fighting all three of the elites in Act 2, so I get to show off how this deck performs against each of them. And they have additional health besides. We're kind of brave to stride into an elite fight here, a burning elite here in Act 2. Usually not something I recommend. You need a very strong and capable deck for this to work. We definitely need to want to, to kill the back one as quickly as we can. This one can either make us vulnerable or entangle us. And although we can purge one of those two with the orange pellets, we really don't want either to happen to us. I think we should use our strength potion here so we're able to do a bit more damage to this red slaver. Probably need to play infinite blades. Leg Sweep is also very good for the sheer amount of block it generates. If I Leg Sweep the front slaver, then the buffer will block the damage from the back one. So I can do like Strike, Infinite Blades, Leg Sweep. Might as well play the Malaise too. Just for a bit of Strength down. And then we look to kill the red slaver next turn, possibly using the Swift Potion to make it happen. Okay, that sounds reasonable. So Strike. Blades, leg sweep here, malaise also here or here, also here, and then don't play the gamble, keep the extra draw for next turn. So keep zero damage there, we get 14 free this turn, trip plus our attack should be more than enough to KO this fool. Let's see if we can draw accuracy, just terror. Well, unload does 30, so we need to deal another 19. 9, 7. So strike plus neutralize plus unload kills this guy. Which means we can terror and shiv one of the others. Front one. Actually, we weaken the front one forever. Let's kill the middle one next. He's adding wounds to the deck every turn, and we'd like to stop that. We can even remove the weaken from us by playing a power, a skill, and an attack. And then the weakness debuff is also removed. And I want to draw all these next turns. So let's just play a strike. Actually, let's play the footwork. These shivs will do so much damage. Beautiful. All right, well, we absolutely cleaned the clocks of the elites this act. Now we're rewarded with a letter opener, which is also gonna go really well with what we're, the deck is doing. If we play three skills in one turn, we'll do five damage to every opponent. We're already playing lots of skills, so this should just be a bit of free additional damage. I think we're gonna skip all three of these. Very few poison cards we've seen. Definitely happy that we landed on uh, a sort of shiv and attack interaction here. Uh, I think trying to trying to make poison cards work this run would not have worked out very well. We get one more upgrade before our act boss. Let's upgrade, I think, this terror to make it free. We could also consider upgrading calculated gamble to make it reusable. But I'm going to upgrade that to terror. One-time use energy upgrades might not seem like they are a big deal, but they really are, uh, allowing you to get every card in your deck played that much faster, or just allowing you to play one more card on a key turn can really make the difference. So, Bronze Automaton, its enemy attacks every other turn. They start with spawning two minions, and then cycling deterministically, flail, boost, flail, boost, hyper beam. So they attack, they buff, they attack, they buff, and then they attack for a very big number. The Hyper Beam on the turn six is when Hyper Beam occurs. So ideally you're looking to either win this fight in six turns, which this deck can almost do, uh, or you're looking to block that Hyper Beam, and we have a couple ways to do that. We A, have enough health to survive it, 
B, we can block it with a buffer effect. And C, we can block with just tons of dexterity, which we're able to generate pretty easily here. As long as we play three attacks each turn, we'll have tons of decks. If I play Deflect, we'll draw a card, but I won't be able to play it, so I don't think I should. Don't think we'll need either of our potions to win this fight, either. Although, using a potion here is certain, certainly something we could consider. Uh, the minions are going to steal cards from us. They always steal the rarest card in your draw pile, so they'll be taking my malaise and my unload. Not cards we actually need for this fight. Something we might want to consider is ignoring the minions entirely and focusing all of our damage on the boss here. It's not always correct to do this for Bronze Automaton, but I think it makes sense in this instance. Alright, we'll play this here as well. Keep removing those artifact layers from the boss. Excellent calculator gimbal. Let's just actually get rid of the last artifact with neutralize, then acrobatics, then calculator gimbal. Let's draw some different stuff, please. Go footwork, cloak, and dagger? Yeah. We'll find that on most turns, we can simply generate so much block. We really don't care about what our opponent is doing that much. Get him letter opener. This is 32, so we're already blocking. I can play the strike. Since the orbs constantly generate block for the bronze automaton, it can make it a little difficult to try to ignore them like this, but I think what we're doing will work out here. That trip. That sure does the most damage, but not very much. Understandable. Okay, we could take a little bit of damage here. Looks like we don't quite fully block this. Could choose to kill one of the minions to let me fully block it. We kill the back one here. We'd also get unloaded into my hand if I do that. I'm sticking to the plan though. even if it means taking 8 damage. So Hyper Beam gets buffered. This attack is last, though, getting through our defenses, meaning we take a disgraceful hit. It's sad, but it's true. It can happen to you, too. That's how it's done. We're able to chunk through the boss there, again, just ignoring the minions, focusing all of our single target damage, which is pretty considerable, actually, uh, onto the boss. And we get through. So we're offered another set of three rare cards here. Bullet time makes your whole hand free. I like bullet time in decks that can draw a ton of cards, but don't have a lot of energy to work with. Two backflips and an acrobatics. This is almost a decent bullet time. Wraith Form gives us Intangible and causes us to lose Dexterity at the end of the turn. Wraith Form is pretty incredible here because the upside is immense, giving us turns of essentially invincibility. And the downside is something that we can negate with a relic we picked up earlier, the Orange Pellets. When you play a power, attack, and skill in one turn, remove all your debuffs. Wraith Form is one of the best ways to block Spire's late game as the silent, and doubly so if you can negate its downside in any way, shape, or form. So Wraith Form here is pretty incredible. Last but not least, Tools of the Trade, draw one, discard one. It's actually quite good for simply 
sifting through the deck, finding more good cards to put in play. Uh, and particularly if you've got many start starter cards left in the deck, then tools can be very, very good. I could see taking either tools of the trade or wraith form here. And either would be pretty good. Since we already have such good block with the dexterity, I'm considering tools of the trade. But the interaction with orange pellets makes me really value the wraith form a lot here. But the whole point of the wraith form is to essentially buy you a little bit of time in combat. Two turns of intangible is protection from just about anything. And that'll allow you to deploy your other powers or damage cards without having to worry about block. That's what makes Wraith Form so strong. I think we're going to go with a Tools of the Trade here so that we can discard our strikes and any statuses or curses we get. But that is a very good Wraith Form, and if we see another Wraith Form, we'll probably take it. For our boss relics, we get two more energy options. Silent, I think, in particular, really likes going to five energy. Um, a lot of cards in this character are quite energy hungry, either being very expensive or allowing you to draw more cards, like these backflips. Combine backflips with lots of energy, and you can get a lot done each turn. So for more energy, there's Slaver's Collar. This is energy during anything that's not a regular fight, during boss and elite fights only. Or there's Philosopher's Stone, one additional strength added to every enemy. Adding strength to enemies can be a bit scary, but with a card like Malaise, you can use the energy from the Philosopher's Stone to remove the additional strength the enemies gain. So I think that this is a very reasonable Philosopher's Stone. That said, I'd probably be personally happier with a Slaver's Collar. It's most of the same upside, but without the downside. Lastly, Sacred Bark doubles the effectiveness of potions. This could be a very, very good boss relic. Um, if you just need a little bit of extra help during specifically the late game, for example here, being able to use this dexterity potion for four points of dexterity against the heart could be a, a really big game changer. Any three of these relics could easily lead to a winning run from here. I think personally I would prefer the Slaver's Caller for that extra energy per turn. But again, I could see either Sacred Bark or Philosopher's Stone being great here either. I'll take the color. So now that we're in Act 3, the final act of Slay the Spire, things are a little bit higher stakes. The enemies in this act have quite a bit more health. So if you haven't figured out a cohesive damage plan, your deck is going to start to fall apart here. At the same time, enemies are willing to attack for 30 or 40 or even 50 damage. So if you don't have a really good way to block in place, you will also really start to struggle here. The elites in this act are quite nasty, but if you're going for a heart victory as we are, you cannot allow yourself to be dissuaded from fighting elites. You still need to get more relics and more money and more card rewards if you're looking to beat the heart. Can't miss any opportunities to get stronger. So for this act, I want to take a path that hits actually as many elites as possible. Since the deck is strong and capable, we should be able to de defeat all the elites of this act. And I see one path in particular that goes through three elite nodes as well as a few rest site nodes. We'll take a bunch of combats, we'll take a couple of elites, and we do get one shop in which can we can remove at least our Writhe Curse. That'd be my, my chief recommendation. You could also go this way, remove two cards at two shops, get a bunch of upgrades, but fight significantly fewer elites. Or you should go for a two elite higher upgrade density path. But we would like to upgrade a few things. I'd like to upgrade the card draw on the acrobatics. I'd like to upgrade the block on the footwork. The tools of the trade upgrade isn't as important to me now that we have five energy per turn with the double boss relics. Uh, although if we take in the sacred bark, I would advocate upgrading tools of the trade here. Good old shapes. These enemies aren't too hard. I'm going to use the letter opener here to put some work in. Or the back road, actually. By playing three skills with our letter opener, we get to do damage to all of them. And that's good. We 
particularly helpful for dealing with this spiker enemy, which will hit us back whenever we strike them. Nobody wants that, spiker. Nobody. We can use the buffer to absorb damage here, or we can wait a turn. Either is valid. Valid way to get through the fight here. Here, three skills. Kills ya. Yeah. Get him, letter opener. We're offered another upgraded deflect, as well as an upgraded slice and an upgraded outmaneuver. I think we have enough energy that we don't need a card like Outmaneuver, but I do recommend Outmaneuver on silent decks that reach the late game without having a lot of energy to work with. One more Deflect is really going to go nicely with the double backflip, double tools, and kunai thing. Let's take one last block card here. I think we're mostly at the peak blocking. Maybe I take a dodge and roll as well, which blocks two times for one energy. Our first event in Act 3 is a tricky one. Jutting from the chaotic terrain around you, a bony sphere surrounds a mysterious glowing object within. This is a fight against the double orb walkers if you want to get a rare relic. These two are very dangerous. They attack relentlessly, sometimes adding burns to your draw pile and gain strength every turn. This fight can be really, really, really nasty. Uh, so if your damage output isn't quick, I, I never advise taking this fight. My usual recommendation, you need about 100 damage in two turns if you want to be able to take these guys on. And I strongly recommend having potions to help you out. I think we're able to fight these two. We might take some damage, but our free block on turn one and turn two, our bonus area damage with the letter opener and specifically the swift potion should make this manageable. Um, but if you're at all uncertain of your deck, I, this of all events, I really recommend not picking the fight on because it can be so, uh, so scary. As soon as you strike the sphere, the sentries spring to life around you. We do get trip turn one. That's going to be good. Um, which one should we target here? They're pretty similar. Don't think we can get a kill turn one, so let's target the back one with less health. And we'll start with um, backflip to draw three here. Don't think this is where I use the dexterity potion. I'm definitely thinking energy potion and or swift potion for this fight though. So we definitely want to play infinite blades. I could strike twice or I could do something else. We'd rather draw the better cards. There we go. Accuracy and tools. I want to play those both, so let's use the energy potion here. Accuracy, tools. And I can either strike this one, or I can play three skills to do five to both. We want to kill one, though. So let's do this. All right, that was our turn one. That wasn't too bad. We blocked both hits. We did some damage. We got vulnerable down. This absolutely looks like I'm going to kill one. We got Cloakenegger, Cloakenegger, Shiv Finisher, so you're super dead, kid. In fact, the five Shivs perfectly kill this fool. Leaving me with two energy for the Finisher. We'll go Dagger Throw, Finisher. Clean. And that's how this fight should go, ideally. But a little bit less damage output, and this could really turn against us. So you really do have to be well-equipped for this to go well. The rare relic in question, a prayer wheel, giving us additional card rewards from regular enemies. That'll look at, let us look at a whole bunch of cards here at the end of the act, which can help us find any last-minute additions we might want. Like another calculated gamble, for example, another zero-cost skill. Good with all the card draw. Could consider this tactician, but I'm not feeling like we need energy all that much. This is better with tools to trade, too. We'll take the gamble. Still skipping those tacticians. The Tomb of Lord Red Mask can have us lose all our money for a relic. 
I don't think so. This this relic is worth about 100 gold to me, usually. And we've got a shop coming up. We want our money there. See you later, Lord Red Mask. See you later. All right, this is half the fight we just fought, so this should be a lot easier. Let's see what we draw here. Usually want to draw first on your turn. Strike him. And then play this for five damage. Letter opener has been really, really cranking out the, the hits here. So, double card wards means we can look at a whole bunch of stuff. I usually recommend looking at both of these before you pick either of them. There is the dodge roll I said I might consider, and it's upgraded, so I guess we're going to take it. Six block this turn, six block next turn. Actually, wait, there's another accuracy here, too. Causing our shivs to do even more damage. That's something we might want to consider. As we're falling a little bit behind in damage, making each shiv hit a little harder would help quite a bit. But I think I'll take the upgraded card over the unupgraded card. There's a few ways we can get the remaining damage we need for the hearts. More on that in a bit. Ah, or we can get this accuracy. Perfect. So then I get the best of both worlds. The accuracy that I want and the dodge and roll. We definitely want to take the opportunity here to remove our writhe curse. We've been lugging this around since Act 2. I'd like to stop doing that now. Dexterity does it affect the turn you get next, uh, the block you get next turn on the dodger roll. So with three footwork, this will be th nine block. Next turn, gain nine block. So it makes dodger roll pretty exceptional with uh, with footwork, especially. I think we want this accuracy. One more copy to make our shivs deal more. Do we want any of the relics here? Start combat with an artifact. Blocks the first debuff. We already have orange pellets to allow ourselves to remove debuffs, so I don't value this that much. Warpaint could upgrade some skills. There's plenty of upgradable good skills in the deck, and even if we hit defense, we would appreciate having a higher block value on them. So I do think the Warpaint upgrades would be pretty good. Or we could get more energy from Happy Flower. That's also reasonable. I'll take the I'll take the war paint. Let's upgrade two skills. It is in fact two defends. Not amazing, but like I said, not bad actually. As we'll appreciate the extra block those offer us. Not too bad. Giant Head, one of the elites in Act 3 here. Giant Head has 500 health, so a major test of your ability to deal damage. You get a countdown from the Giant Head. 4 3 2 1 and then you are asked why you're still here. Kind of think of this like the, the car bonus stage in Street Fighter. You have a huge, durable opponent that you must defeat within a certain time frame or else. Once the Giant Head's countdown ends, their small attacks become huge attacks. And if you're not able to block very, very consistently, you'll find yourself uh, spinning towards disaster. So you should use those initial turns the Giant Head offers you to get all your powers in play. And then after that, it's all about dealing damage. This opponent ha also has a debuff called Slow, which causes them to take more attack damage every time a card is played on your turn. The more cards you can play against Giant Head, the more damage you can deal with each of them. And the trick against this opponent is to play your cards in order from least damaging to most damaging in order to facilitate that effect. So we want to go strike, then shiv, then unload, then finish her last. I'm playing all these zero cost cards before the finisher, meaning the finisher deals 15, 16 times five. And that's pretty good. That's pretty good. And I want that accuracy in my, uh, in my hand as well. Looks like that's not gonna happen. going there. Alright, 
We don't need the survivor because we already have a block here. 27 damage is thanks to the weakness. Normally this would be 40 damage. But because we've reduced it, we don't have to block for nearly as much. And that's sort of a multi-layer defense is coming into play. Weakness plus good blocks combine to make for really effective damage mitigation. And that's kind of what this deck is founded on here. Goodbye. Get a Gremlin Horn, which will give us a card drawn and energy when any enemy dies. More block cards. We've already got the upgraded versions of these, though. And here's where I think we should stop taking cards. To take either of these would be a mistake. It would be bad to flood the deck with unupgraded cards. So you should resist the urge to take these, even though they're more copies of what we already have. Or perhaps in part because they're more copies of what we already have. This flex potion is very, very, very useful. Five strength. At the end of the turn, we lose five strength. This is a potion that can be comboed with the orange pellets. And so we're going to pick that up. Because we can turn this into a permanent point, uh, five points of strength. Well, permanent for one fight anyway by combining the Purge with the Potion. Three Jawworms, very threatening set of opponents here. Let's, uh, let's utilize this turn one they're giving us and see what we can do. This is a lot more damage. Let's damage the ones that are buffing. We want them to be dead next turn. That's right, Prayer Wheel does not have any effect on elites, just regular fights. Which can make it a little tricky. Nice. Uh, discard this. Alright, these three die with uh, relatively little problem here. Now able to do 14 base per shiv. That's going to become 16 when we upgrade the other accuracy. Weak potion, probably not that useful for this deck. We might want an after image, one block per card. Although we can generate tons of block already, the heart that we'll be fighting soon deals one damage to us per card we play. So an after image can help mitigate that. But I think because of how much dexterity we have, um, this after image actually doesn't contribute that much. What I would like to get is another upgraded Cloak and Dagger here, all three of these cards being randomly upgraded. Since we have two accuracies, the damage output is pretty substantial, and the kunai is working great too. So we'll take this. But I'm, I'm not gonna not gonna take this after image. I think it's redundant. Useful but redundant. Second opponent is Reptomancer, the Dagger Summoner. Reptomancer shouldn't be too bad because of the Gremlin Horn here, but this could be one of the nastiest elites this act. Reptomancer will summon one, or uh, if you're on higher ascension, two daggers per turn. And that can really give the player a hard time. Fortunately, the extra draws from the Gremlin Horn will help a lot here. to malaise the Repto here. Draw anything? No. Just draw attacks next turn. We'll just draw attacks next turn. This might be a turn we have to use our buffer, but that's okay. 
looks like it is, because I discarded the defend. I have no qualms against relentlessly attacking the Reptomancer. Oh, we do draw a block, after all. Well then. You can see each turn we're able to, to both deal damage and block. And that's, uh, that's a reward for both the, the mixture of offense and defense that we've uh, put into this deck, as well as our tools of the trade, letting us look at one more card each turn so that we can choose the right mixture of each per whatever turn we want. Discarding this stinky, unupgraded strike, for example. Get a mall bank, which will give us a bit of money. 12 per floor until the uh, the shop at the end of the run. Offered another tactician, but there's an adrenaline here. Pretty hard to say no to this card. Gives you an energy, two card draws, and exhaust. Just a one-time free draw and energy. Rarely do you skip this. We also get a White Beast Statue, giving us a potion after every combat. That's going to be pretty good. A few more upgrades for the end of the run. Uh, let's grab our Red Key now. We need all three to go to Act 4. Uh, and I recommend grabbing the Red Key before you reach the final Fire of the Act, lest you forget to do so. It's happened to me, it could happen to you. And I'm not going to play that. We're just going to malaise this fool. This Maw is one of the trickier opponents this act. They have a huge base health and a sort of relentless attack pattern that gets stronger and stronger over time. Fortunately, we're able to remove their debuffs with our orange pellets and uh, block their initial attacks here. want to use our accuracies and all these shivs to deal tons of damage. Get all the powers in play. Definitely kind of at the upper limit for how many powers we have. If you put too many powers into a deck, then you'll start to draw hands that are only powers and no actual block or attack cards. That could be very, very punishing in the late game of Slay the Spire. first blade dance we've seen. Even though it's not upgraded, I think we should take this. Three shivs for one energy. There's a lot of shivs. And our shivs are doing very tremendous damage. It's also one dexterity from the kunai. It's a great card. Take a second dex potion. I like the current mixture we have. I'm going to leave this dex potion on the ground. Could take another unupgraded cloak and dagger. That I'm not going to do. I don't think we need too many more cards. All right, this opponent is the Writhing Mass. This one's a bit of a tricky opponent. Writhing Mass changes their attack intent every time they take unblocked attack damage. So every time we strike them and they don't have block, they'll change what they're doing. The Writhing Mass has, let's look at it. There's five different things that they can do. And it's, uh, again, random every time they change. There's a 16 block, 16 attack. A 12 attack that inflicts weak and vulnerable, a 9 times 3 multi-attack, a 38 damage single attack, and last but certainly not least, the Parasite. Permanently add a curse to the player's deck. They can only do that once per fight. So, on each turn, if the attack that they're currently doing is the best one for you, for example, they're attacking for 16, I'm blocking for 16, if we change what they're doing, they either attack for less and debuff us, which we don't want. They attack us for more, which means we don't block. Or they add a curse to our deck. All of those are much worse than what we've got going on. So what we should not do is play any more attack cards here. We just want to stop. And draw some other stuff. Have some minus strength. You nerd. And as a general rule, we'll want to leave one attack unplayed so that we have the 
always have the option to reroll the parasite, the writhing mass, to a, a, a better attack pattern for us. I think we'll stop here. We want to do some damage, but again, not too much damage each turn. Or rather, not, not overcommit with our damage. Don't play it all, because then we have no... We have no panic button. The Writhing Mass, unlike most other fights, doesn't get any stronger over time, so you can take your sweet time in this combat. As long as it takes to get the outcome that you're looking for. This is fine, we'll stop here. So when the Writhing Mass is doing this one, this is the move that adds a curse. This is when you want to strike and change the intent to anything else. Or you can just go for a kill. 21 plus 21. Yeah, you're dead. There you go. Unupgraded cards largely to be avoided here. We could take another upgraded Blade Dance. Let's do it. That's all the shivs in the world. Concentrate could be a way to gain energy, but with our five base per turn, we're mostly sorted here. Let's take one last Blade Dance. This has become a very large deck. 38 cards. As long as most of the cards you're adding are upgraded, there's nothing wrong with going to 30 or 40 cards. Just know that you probably need some cards that say draw cards, uh, or it's going to take a really long time to get through the deck of cards. I think my last two upgrades should probably be accuracy and footwork, the two powers. We could maybe upgrade one of these calculated gambles to make them reusable. But with the deck as large as, as, large as it is, I don't actually think we'll need to reuse them. All right, Nemesis is intangible every other turn. They can only be damaged on off turns, but our draw consistency on this deck should mean we're mostly not caring too much about the Nemesis here. You can add status cards to the deck. Actually, speaking of 40 card decks, one of the resiliences you gain for having so many cards is that when enemies add status cards, like the burns here, uh, having 40 other real cards means you're very unlikely to draw those status cards on any turn. And that's good. Be vulnerable. The attacks don't do much, but they do a little bit. Just one damage apiece. We can still get the dexterity from the kunai here. So, might as well, right? This looks a little trickier to block. 45 damage. We can always fall back to the, the fossilized helix. But we might be able to block this more conventionally. Let's see. Yeah, this looks doable. Actually, we might be able to kill here. If shivs are doing 24 damage, then this blade dance does 96 damage. Not quite, huh? Like that, we make a ton of block. Beautiful. And win with one shiv next turn for the ink bottle. 24 damage. No problem. Akabeko doesn't do much. Eight additional damage on our first attack each combat. Very more uh, an early game relic, I tend to think. And yeah, rather than upgrading one of our two Calculated Gambles, why don't we just add a third copy? That way we can play Calculated Gamble three times, essentially. Liquid Memories is a pretty good potion, letting us get a card out of the discard pile. I think we're mostly set up here, though. I like the current potions a lot. I'm going to skip this. Upgrade that footwork, like I said I would. And we go into our boss fight. The Awakened One here is a two-phase boss fight. This boss is all about powers. Their curiosity effect says whenever you play a power card, the boss gains strength. However, the boss doesn't gain strength any other way, so it doesn't gain strength over time or anything. 
There's a, a number of different ways to approach this fight. Sometimes you want to avoid playing your powers, but uh, for this deck specifically, we can remove all the strings from the Awakened One with the Malaise card. So our strategy is going to be to mostly ignore the Curiosity effect and just play all of our power cards anyway. What we will want to do is kill these cultists fairly quickly, focusing our damage on them initially. Although I am going to put the Terror on the Awakened One. We'll play our attacks on the cultists because they start as a low damage, but they rapidly become a, a very big threat. So I'm playing here. Strike, leg sweep, deflect, and then gamble for five tall. Yeah, we can the boss. Play strike. Damage. Okay, pretty good turn one. We almost kill one of the birds. We weakened the boss. We got a few important powers in play. Everything is going pretty well here. Let's discard Trip for this turn. Although Trip could probably help me kill the bird. Okay, let's discard Neutralize for this turn. Kill the bird. Blade Dance is here. But first. Okay. Probably malaise in a future turn. You may continue to gain strength, Awakened One, if that is your whim. Alright, here's our malaise, so we'll want to remove as much strength from the boss as we can. Ideally blocking at the same time, but we could just use the buffer to absorb the hit. Perhaps that's what we should do. Let's do that. Play the accuracy, malaise, let the buffer take the hit. And the boss is basically back to base strength. We'll still play the footwork. The boss will have a little bit of strength, but we'll be easily able to outblock them. And with our blade dances doing near 100 damage, then uh, holy moly. Life's good. But after the Wicked One dies the first time will come back to life. Like I said, a two-phase fight. Uh, I think our draw next turn's looking fine. And they attack for a very large number initially. Certain decks may want to have a, a setup or preparation for this attack. We're actually mostly just set here, since our blocks block for so much. There's not a whole lot of worrying that we need to do. We never saw the silent card well-laid plans on this run, which allows you to retain cards from turn to turn. That can be a successful keystone for a lot of silent decks, but we've achieved something similar with this deck. Instead of retaining cards, we just have a lot of card draw, and we have a lot of the same cards. So we're almost always going to get a similar hand, because I've got two backflips and two blade dances and three cloak and daggers and two deflects, so I'll always get some mixture of those cards. Kind of like a... 30 or 60 card competitive deck of cards in a, in a different game would be constructed of many copies of the same card for, again, the same reason. The player wants a higher likelihood of drawing those particular cards. Ideally, we'd like to end this fight with the ink bottle on as high a number as possible. Nine is the goal here. Looks like we can do that. If I play Strike and then Finisher, we kill it. The Ink Bottle goes to 9. That way we'll draw a card on the first turn in Act 4, which is going to be pretty important. That's the base game of Slay the Spire defeated with a, a really decisive deck here. Uh, I think the double accuracies are really pushing the damage of this deck. If you took exactly this deck as it was, minus the accuracies, the damage would be extremely, extremely low, and we'd be losing. But you could get there similarly with uh, maybe an Envenom, or Caltrops, or a couple copies of Noxious Fumes. Could could also do the work in place of these accuracies. Uh, that said, the, this is a, a delightfully synergistic deck overall. Very happy with uh, how it has played out, and I hope it's been demonstrative to... Uh, to folks as to one of the ways, one of the many, many different ways Silent can get to Act 4 here. Now that we're in the final act, we still have a little bit left to do. One rest site, one shop, 
one elite fight, and then the final battle, the hearts. So, with our one upgrade, I think upgrading probably the acrobatics to draw one more is probably our best. Other good upgrades include one more energy off Adrenaline, one more energy off Tools the Trade, one more Shiv off the Blade Dance. Maybe upgrading one of our three gambles. We have enough weak that I think upgrading Neutralize is a bad idea. Let's upgrade the acrobatics here. More card draw is more consistency for this deck. Our final shop, we have 308 gold. The membership card is slightly less than half our money, so it's a technically slight advantage to purchase. That's pretty funny. Some other decent things here. Lantern gives us energy turn one. That could be nice. Card removal would let us remove one of these strikes. We never actually did get rid of them, although I, I spent a lot of time at the start of this run talking about how you should remove them. We ended up mostly removing curses instead. That said, getting rid of the strikes would still make this deck a lot better. Hilariously on brand is the Ninja Scroll. Three shivs on turn one gives us a bit of initial damage, as well as a free point of dexterity with the Kunai. It's not bad, although I don't think it's necessarily worth spending money on here compared to, like, Lantern Remove. I think the no-nonsense play here is Lantern Remove. Not exactly happy with these. Actually, this will help us against the Elites, though, because I'm going to use the Flex Potion in that fight. Actually, okay, let's do it. I'll take the Ninja Scroll. We get three shivs on turn one. The reason I'm doing this is twofold. One, for the point of dexterity with the Kunai, and two, because it's going to be some substantial additional damage here against Spire Spear and Spire Shield. These two are some gnarly opponents. You're faced with a surrounded effect. One opponent in front of you, one behind of you. They don't have that much health, although it's over 100 each. Um, a lot of upfront damage is the easiest solution to this fight. But if your deck is too slow, these two will absolutely do very enormous damage. Let's talk about their pattern a little bit. Two dangerous opponents here. First and foremost, Spire Spear. Each of these have a three-turn rotation of moves. Spire Spear always starts with six by two and put two burns into your deck. On low ascension, they go to the discard pile, but on high ascension, they go directly on top, which is a, a real problem. On turn two, they'll attack for 10 times four, and then they'll start alternating between Piercer and Burn Strike and doing Skewer every third turn. So turn one is always Burn Strike, turn two is always Piercer, uh, sorry, is always Skewer, and then on turn three it's randomly either Burn Strike or Piercer. For Spire Shield, it's similar but a little bit different. It's turn one and two that are random, and turn three that's guaranteed. Turn one, they'll either attack for... Uh, it's a base of 14. Note that in this fight, whichever enemy you're not facing deals bonus damage to you, to the tune of 50% more. Uh, and they also have a move that blocks for 30 to both sides. Lastly, on turn three, they attack for 38 damage and gain block equal to the damage. So usually, by default, 38, but that can be modified. Knowing which enemy to, to fight... Uh, to target first in this fight is really tricky. The exact opponent that I recommend going for first really depends on your damage output and the, the draws. Uh, I usually advocate if you can kill Spire Spear on turn one, that's a good idea. Uh, or if you can kill Spire Spear before turn two and prevent that 10 by four, that could be a good idea. Otherwise, killing the shield first to prevent the blocks and the strength down can be quite nice. We've been keeping this Flex Potion for this fight specifically. I'm going to use it here. We gain 5 strength for turn 1, but we lose that strength at the end of the turn unless we play a power, an attack, and a skill. In which case, so much more happens. And that's going to let us dish out a lot of damage with these shivs. Let's see. Shivs are going to be minus 8. Um, 15 apiece. So, 45, 45... 
And then these are... This is 11, and this is 14. So what is that math-wise? 45 plus 45 plus 11. 14, 14. And 8. It tells me that we have... 137 damage visible in our hand. Which means we cannot kill the Spire Spear, but we can kill the Spire Shield this turn. And I think that's what we should do, is kill one on this turn if we can. So let's do that. Which also gives us a Gremlin Horn activation. Meaning we can then play Footwork, Infinite Blades, and I guess a Strike? Hold on, we're drawing one more card. Yeah, a Strike. And the Deflect. Okay, so. Down one opponent here, we get 14 free block. This is the 10 by 4 we were warned about, but we can generate enough block that I think we're not too afraid of this. Especially with Leg Sweep here. Let's uh, draw three more. Let's draw four more. Let's draw many more cards. There we go. And that extra five strength really just shredding through these two. Just like before, we'd like the ink bottle to be set to nine here, which looks like we conveniently do without too much work. Meaning we'll draw a card after playing the first card against the heart. Of course we find the bag of prep. That's funny. Draw two additional cards on turn one. Unfortunately, our starting hand is full from Ninja Scroll, so we won't be doing that. But uh, we can add one last Cloak and Dagger for an even 40 cards and four copies of Cloak. Seems perfect to me. Let's take it. All right, that brings us to full health and three potions. I really, really do think you've got much better odds in the heart fight if you can uh, carry some potions into it. And here's the final opponent of the run, the one I'm trying to teach you how to beat, the Corrupt Heart in Act 4. Let's talk about the Heart's attack pattern here. This thing is big and nasty and mean. 750 hit points, or 800 on higher ascensions, means it takes a lot of damage to kill, yet you have a strict time limit here. The longer this fight goes on, the stronger the Heart gets, and it becomes really nasty really quickly. So... On turn one, the heart uses Debilitate. You are inflicted with two vulnerable, two weak, two frail, and one of every status card in the game gets added to your draw pile. Yes, that's unfair. Too bad. It's happening to you. So that is going to really limit your ability to block or deal damage or just protect yourself in general. And then the heart will immediately follow that up with two really nasty attacks. The Echo which does a base of 45, 67 with Vulnerable, and Blood Shots, 2 times 15, 3 times 15 with Vulnerable. Those two thing attacks combined, if you don't draw enough block or any at all, will kill almost any character from full health. So having a damage mitigation plan is essential to surviving the heart's initial attacks. Every third turn, the heart will buff after attacking twice gaining two points of strength and some other additional property, and then these two attacks will occur again. And they occur in random order here. Bloodshots, Echo, Echo, Bloodshots. It's all up to the heart's RNG, which one happens first. As the fight gets on longer and longer, that multi-attack times 15 Bloodshots gets nastier and nastier. And that attack is part of why I advocated for strength reduction cards on Silent. Uh, Malaise is the only one we managed to pick up, but multiple copies of Piercing Whale can also really, really, really help in this fight. I'm going to start by drinking our Dexterity Potion. Our turn one is full of shivs here. We, we mostly want to play as many attacks as we can. But we have to beware, because every time we play a card, Beat of Death does one damage to us. Thankfully, we started with 10 block from the boat thingy here. Oh, we drew accuracy, too. Cool, let's play that. Make these shivs do a bit more damage. Will he be able to deal a lot of damage on turn one, then? That's good. 
Could gambler acrobatics looking for other powers? I think we want to keep most of the powers in our draw pile to go with the orange pellets, though. So let's just play Infinite Blades, Cloak, Cloak, Blade Dance here. Gain as much dexterity as we can, and deal as much damage as we can. Thankfully, we're generating more block than we're taking damage from the Beat of Death. Drew an Adrenaline. Okay, I'll play that. We get a dodge and roll that can generate some block for the first attack turn of the hearts. Or again, I could keep drawing cards, but like I said, I'd, I'd prefer the blocks actually, st uh, the powers, excuse me, actually stay in the draw pile for now. So let's finish with dodge and roll here. And then we should get an extra draw from Ink Bottle next turn. We'll also gain 14 block from the boat thingy. Here goes. Get attacked by the singular big attack first. We did not draw a lot of mitigation for it, but this is where the fossilized helix comes in. This buffer preventing this attack is one of the most consistent ways for me to, to survive this hit. So we're fortunate to have it here, but we also have available the option to use the swift potion to look for more answers this turn. But even if I simply play all the cards in my turn, this is a, a completely non-threatening turn thanks to that buffer. So we, we could use the Swift Potion, but we absolutely don't need to. That said, we would like to get a power into my hands so that we can take advantage of our orange pellets here. Let's do it. Let's Swift Potion. Just draw a little bit more block, which is not necessarily useful here. Let's see. Yeah. I should feel like that was a bit of a waste of our potion. Still, we're drawing closer to our uh, our powers, so that's good. If we didn't have the Helix, we'd still be taking not that much damage here, so this would absolutely be survivable. But it's uh, certainly a bit awkward that we did not draw Weaken here. We were hoping that the Leg Sweep or the Malaise would be able to reduce this. And yeah, that's what, like we said, the buffer is for. Get him, buffer. All right, here's a power. So we can use power plus attack plus skill to remove the debuffs. No frail, no vulnerable. I'll take a beat of death damage to ensure that. Play the footwork before the defend. Then an attack. Then a skill. And the orange pellets say we are no longer debuffed. We're no longer frail, we're no longer vulnerable. That's good. Play all the attacks here. We do want to keep gaining dexterity. We do want to keep doing damage. And we block most of, but not quite all of the damage here. Didn't draw the malaise before the first multi-hit. The first time the heart buffs its strength, it's going to gain two charges of the artifact buff, which will cause it to become resilient to debuffs. We actually really want to land... Actually, all of these in the draw pile is fine. Yeah, that's fine. With almost all of our status cards still in the draw pile, I think we can work with that. So I'm not going to play these calculated gambles. I'm actually quite happy with what we've drawn in the way that we've drawn it. So we'll just stop there. All right, here's the second multi-attack, 4x15. Definitely getting a lot scarier, a lot faster. Ideally, we'd like to be able to use our malaise to shut this down, but we didn't draw it, so I can't. Or can I? Well, we can draw a card with Ink Bottle, but it's only a 50-50 that we get the malaise. Let's trip to remove one artifact. Two artifact means the first two debuffs are negated. Um, do I want to? I think I want to land the the terror rather than the leg sweep. So let's leg sweep here. Remove the other artifacts. Apply vulnerable. Play accuracy and draw the card. Is it malaise? It's not. Okay, so we'll just play the defend, and we actually block for enough that we don't take damage anyway. So that's not too bad. Thanks to 13 points of dexterity. How'd that happen? Kunai. 
Then I guess we'll play the malaise on this turn to apply weaken for the long term here. Perfect block. And that partially reduces the, the heart's strength for the next um, few turns. So, for example, our next multi-attack will still only be 4x15. Because we did that. Goes away. Three defends. No use here. But I can play them for the letter opener, if nothing else. I note that we're mostly done with the heart. This is a fight that has to be done in about 10 turns or less, because if the fight goes beyond that, then the heart will start to gain nastier and nastier buffs. Note that now that this heart has buffed its strength a second time, Beat of Death increases by one. Now we're taking two damage per card, and these shivs are really starting to work against us. Yet our huge block per block card is going to keep us safe for the most part. But you can see that our block gets worn through very quickly. And that starts to become pretty scary. Look at those shivs go. Man, that's well over 200 damage that turn. Spicy. Um, what do you got? Could energy potion for two strikes? Uh, there's not a lot of use for this potion. Let's, might as well. I think that's it. These shivs do plenty of damage, and that's one dead heart. So there is a victorious silent run. GG's. Hopefully this run was able to show you some of the synergies and tactics that the silent can use to both get stronger in Slay the Spire, uh, of course, across, your, across the course of your run, as well as tactics you can use to defeat the Corrupt Heart in Act 4 specifically. Uh, even if it was done using cards that uh, aren't necessarily the most typical for a run on this channel. If you liked that video, then uh, please do subscribe to the channel. Hit the link below. Till next time, my dear viewers, this is Baylor signing off. Best of luck in your own Spire journeys. And again, thank you so much for watching. Hey there. If you enjoyed that video, watch this one next. And before you go, join us on Twitch and watch live. I'm there five days a week playing Slay the Spire, answering questions, and chilling with the community. Click the link in the description to follow right now. Ta-ta for now.